10 phone calls. So I'm going to start over. Welcome, everybody. I'm Mike Espinos. I've been a Gary Khan attendee for about four years. I'm one of the Orange Pumpkin crew, the volunteers that have been helping you out. Um, I usually run a few a few sessions every year, and this year is the controversial, um, the, the the diversity panel, which I really don't feel like should be controversial. Uh, Alyssa, should it be controversial? Mm-hmm. No, no, it shouldn't be. Not at all. Uh, in fact, the fact that it is controversial only means that we need more discussion on this very topic. I mean, to be fair, girls don't game, right? <laughs> yeah, you're talking to the girl that actually played wargaming back in the 80s and was the one that brought Dungeons & Dragons to my school. Yeah, girls don't game. Um, Although it was fair that back yeah, sure. in the 70s, 80s, you know, it, we were thinner on the ground, but... We're not now, you know, and so I think I think having a discussion about this and being aware of this and being accommodating that this is where it's at. This is the change, right? Yeah, no, I mean, um, actually, I'm going to bring Alyssa to the main uh, and here we go. So I'm going to put Alyssa up on the main here because yeah, no, guess I mean, what? Um, oh, hold on. I got to figure out what just happened. Alt tab. I'm getting feedback. So I'm going to put Alyssa up on the main. There we go. He's listening. I muted myself there. I got to figure out what just happened. Alt tab. I'm getting feedback. So yeah. Up All right. Um, Hold on. There. Technical difficulties. Good. There we go. Ah. Muted. Hey, and then I also have Gina, who's just now joining us. Uh, Gina's going to be joining us from phone because it's the Gary Khan way to have technical difficulties. Right? Yeah. Talk about technical difficulties. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Thank you. Um, I can't see that. That's unfortunate. You're a you're a uh, flashing, um, you're a flashing call symbol. So, oh, yeah. The um, well, the first thing I really want to discuss with everybody is that oh. we've always been here. Um, I was I may okay. First off, I am the least useful person. Oh, admit here we go. Ah, oh, there we go. Gina's trying technical uh, things. Um, I am. I was. Oh, I'm gonna mute. I'm gonna mute you on phone until you figure that out. Uh, Gina, you'll have to unmute yourself by hitting star six. So, the important thing about diversity is it's always been here. When I first started playing uh, games, the interesting thing is that we found out my friends came out to me because they played characters that were a different gender than they were, and that was that it gave them the ability to to be who they were. And the cool thing was that since I was a nerd who wasn't accepted by society, I kind of knew where they were coming from. And I was I was accepting. But as gaming grew, it came, became a bigger thing and bullying became a thing. Well, bullying's always been a thing. But I am the I am the person who's going to probably need to talk the least. So I just want to facilitate one more piece of information before I hand um, a bulk of the talking over to my participants, uh, Gina and Alyssa. And the first thing I want to bring in is a really great tool called the uh, Gamers uh, Safety Toolkit. And I'm sorry that you guys are seeing all of this stuff on my screen, but I am a tech person who is not very techy at the moment. All right. For those of you who are not familiar with the Safety Toolkit, I'm going to put it up on the big screen. Um, oops, sorry, wrong big screen. I have three monitors. Life is difficult. Um, I only have one that's difficult. The uh, safety toolkit is essentially a a great guide, um, and a very short thing to walk through is that you need to have discussions about what people are comfortable with, not just before the game starts in a session zero, but throughout the game. And you also need to have to be honest with your players in a way that allows them to feel comfortable. Um, in a way that allows them to feel comfortable being who they are. So one of the things this offers is the X, the N, and the O cards. Um, Most of what we use is the X card, which is to say, hey, stop right there. I'm not comfortable with where this is going. Now, in my own personal life, I didn't realize there were certain things that I had problems with until I was running a, um, I was running um, Waterdeep Dragon Heist. And we were helping the kids in the sewers and the DM decided to play it up a little funny, and uh, some of the kids in the sewers turned into uh, hatched demons because we were running the summer campaign. I wasn't okay with child death. 
I didn't know that. I got real upset in the process of the game. I've since talked to other players. Um, I have a friend of mine who really is hesitant about playing RPGs because her father was abusive and everybody loves to get drunk in a, in a tavern and that gets uncomfortable for her. It brings back bad memories. So I'm going to put a link in the, um, I'm going to put a link into the, in the, into the Twitch chat, which by the way, Twitch chat people say, hi, Um, I'm reading your stuff as you go. So I'll respond to you as we can, but that's enough talking from me. What I want to do now is I want to hand over. Um, I want to give the first question. Uh, hold on. I want to give. Um, I want to hand over the talking to Alyssa and Gina. Um, we'll go in alphabetical order for this question uh, to start talking. Alyssa, what can what can DMs and players do to make other people feel more comfortable at the table? Okay, um, I actually, I'm going to start with almost like the building blocks here and just go right from the beginning and the core foundation of all of this. Um, and if I may, I'm going to actually do an anecdotal story, a short one that leads to what I think is the first building block. Yeah, go nuts. I was talking about that very toolkit on my Facebook wall some months ago, and it's a great toolkit, by the way. Everyone interested in this topic should get it. And um, I posted a link to it and someone came in who was a GM and his attitude was paraphrasing. If my players don't like it, they can get up and leave. I'm just going to do my thing. So I'm just going to pause there on his little quote, because I think it reveals the fundamental building block that we need to have as players and GMs. We need to have a little bit of empathy. And we need to have a little bit of maturity. This is a social game in a social environment with other human beings. And particularly if you are around people at a convention or new people at your regular tabletop, I think we need to have empathy and awareness for the fact that not everyone is like us. And we need to accept that and be mature enough to uh, allow then a accepting and diverse and welcoming game environment. And Gina, do you have anything you want to add to that? Uh, you know, I agree with what Alyssa is saying. Um, I also, uh, one of the first things as a GM is um, to kind of know who your players are a little bit. Uh, to sort of help them out in, in things that may, maybe they're not even sure they need help with, but sort of kind of almost predict a little bit. Um, doing that at conventions is a little difficult because you're having people you don't usually know coming to the table. Uh, in a home game, I, I, I tend to know, and I, I'll little um, personal anecdotal stuff as well. Um, my home game, my tabletop home game, consists of uh, six minors and two adults. Uh, so obviously we keep things on a level that is uh, appropriate to them. Of those minors that play at our table, uh, at least two of them are on the autism spectrum. And one of them, and two of them also have PTSD, a uh, pediatric PTSD, uh, not necessarily the same two. Uh, so to know that is to know those things that are going to help them along. Like I, for example, I know that my uh, my autistic player needs visualization, needs to have visual representation. Where some people can play more like a theater of the mind kind of game, or can play with very minimal visual representation. Uh, she does very well with a a, a uh, with the mat and the little figures and things drawn out on it uh, on a whiteboard. She also has a whiteboard of her own that she can write things down on. Uh, and when she's not engaged directly, she can just sort of scribble on it and whatnot. That keeps her engaged, but also gives her a chance to sort of sim because she has to, which is another thing that, that to remember with certain players at the table, they're going to have to move around. They're going to have to get up. They're going to have to fiddle on their phone, not because they're being disrespectful, but because they're being themselves, they're, 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 they have social anxiety, they've got some, some issues and whatnot that make it hard for them to just 
sit and listen while the other people are talking. Um, so to know your players in a, in a con setting is it, more of a uh, starting out with, with that little a little bit of a questionnaire or maybe sending something to them ahead of time if you know who your player is going to be and you have access to that information. Uh, to say here's a little little questionnaires I've got and uh, you just fill this out for me. Is there anything I need to know before we all sit down together? Uh, and that's a simple thing. Another thing that works um, at a con especially, and I, I really wish that everyone did this in a number of different settings, is when you sit down and you say, hi, my name is Gina, I'm your DM. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And just so you know, I have a little bit of a hearing issue, so speak up, no, don't forget that if I ask you to repeat yourself, I am listening. And this way, they feel comfortable now letting me know what they, what they need to know. I have a transgender child who plays. And for him to be able to feel comfortable saying, uh, okay, my pronouns are, uh, is something that's very important to him and very important to us to make him feel comfortable at the table. Gina, I like that you brought up the, um, even if you're a cisgender, using your, uh, announcing your pronouns is a great way to uh, help other people f feel comfortable about announcing theirs. Um, one of the things that I had talked to Caroline about this year was uh, um, how we could do that with the with the name badges. And we were working on a solution to that. Um, I also make my own pins for people and I have them in all three uh, setups of he, him, uh, she, her, they, them. And I try to give them out to people because I want everyone to feel comfortable not just people who are are using a pronoun that may not uh, fit their fit their 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 um, outward uh, presentation. Exactly, exactly, uh, and it makes it so that it's not them making some sort of statement and having to quote unquote come out with that. It's more of a well, we're all doing it, and it, it's everyone around the table would would be, would be expected. So if you just let me know your names and your pronouns. Anything else I need to know about you? Anything else we need to know as a sort of introduction? Uh, if we normalize that and make that into something that we we do regularly at our table, that it shows rather than just saying this is a safe space, it shows that it's a safe space. It actually speaks much louder than words. Absolutely. Um, what's a way when when introducing players that are a are introducing an NPC that's a non-standard uh, non-standard fit. So, for example, in as I already mentioned, um, Waterdeep Dragon Heist, there is a a shop that's near the tavern that's owned by two Genasi, uh, two male Genasi, who are married. Um, there's there's ways of saying that you know here's I can't remember their names, but like say here's Chris and and his partner um, Stan. You know, what's the right way and what's the wrong way of going about um, about saying that without being obvious and pointing to it? Just saying it. Wow, that's simple. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I tend to agree with Gina. You just, I, I think if you're going to stop a game and put a spotlight on it, it's kind of defeating the purpose. You just do it. It's part of the game. It's part of the setting. It's part of what we're doing here. This is Stan. This is his uh, partner, Phil. And just go. You know, yeah. just keep on going. Yeah, so it's not, it's, you don't like stage whisper, they're gay. You just go, no, yeah, no. this is Stan and Phil, no. or this is Stan and Chris, yeah. Um, how do you Someone respond, though, to a out. player who... Someone might say, hey, wait a second, can you clarify that for me? Or or what do you mean, there's just, there's two, and then there's that's his husband? Like, yeah, and then you move on. Now, yeah. how, how do you reply to a player who might be, um, a player who might be incredulous of that? Like, a what? It's a game. Uh, okay. It is a fantasy setting that very much reflects the way things uh, are, are sometimes in, in real life. It's all fantasy games. Most Dungeons and Dragons, on some level, reflect what's really going on in the world. There's war, there's conflict, there's uh, skullduggery of, of various sorts. And I'm, we're playing on a fantasy or a science fiction type of level for that. But in reality, if you wanted to stop and make connections to that, you really can. It's not that out of this world. One of the most successful things about any setting 
is verisimilitude, which is things that are familiar, even if they're not the most familiar thing. Even if they're not, like, oh, yes, you don't really see dragons every day. But, or you don't have magic flying through the air and whatnot all the time every day, or laser guns for that matter. But when you have something that's familiar, then it's easy for you to bridge over to that fantasy or that science fiction type of thing. One of the reasons why Harry Potter is so popular is because kids who read it see that these kids go to classes that they can mirror. There's their, there's their potion class of chemistry, and their history of magic is, is history. Arithmancy is obviously mathematics. So they can make those familiar connections to it, and then from there it bridges into the fantasy. So it's a reality. It is if you go go places, you might find someone who is who, who has a you might find a man who has a husband. You might find somebody who is not cisgender. And in a fantasy role play setting, there it is. And you don't need to focus on it. You don't need to dwell on it if you don't want to. You just go, okay, we'll move on. You're talking to one person or the other. Um now with that, what are um what are some natural ways that we can that we can communicate inclusivity without um, making people feel uncomfortable that they're being targeted out for inclusivity? Let's see. I know it's a tough question. An example yeah. is um, one of the things that I know that my students fear is that when they see something that says, you know, kids welcome, they have two things that they, that they worry about is one, does that mean that, um, it's going to be geared towards kid kids or is it something where they're just going to assume like a, they're going to assume what a kid is. They're gonna have a preconceived notion. Um, how, how is it that a, what are things that a person can do to be an ally? Uh, well, instead of saying kids welcome, you can say all are welcome. In other ways, that, yeah, all are welcome. Um, all are welcome, uh, family friendly. Right. Now, family what, friendly, uh, it, was, it indicates that you know there are adults and minors also involved. It's a, a an environment where where there's a mix of age intergenerational. Okay. Um, what are some good ways, either of you, for um, shutting down behavior that is toxic to the table without starting a fight. Well, personally, I mean, I'm going to go back uh, just um, a conversation or so ago where Gina was doing a great job of describing, um, yes, this is a same-sex couple and just how normal this is in the real world um, and whether it be or, or fantasy world or call Cthulhu world. Um, and you posted the question of well, what what are you going to do if there's a player at the table that objects to this, um, which then sort of shoehorns into the well, what do you do if you've got a player who's actually been a little bit toxic? Um, for starters, I don't think um, if a player is going to sit there and sort of say what same sex that you should actually uh, overly address that. It's like yeah, and move on with the game. It's about the game. It's about the broader group. And if you've got, though, that same person that wants to keep pulling it back to them, then I think there needs to be very, uh, uh, honestly, this could be toxic because they're uh, booking diversity, but it could also be toxic just because they're dominating the table. It could be toxic because they're ruining the game for the people in a multitude of different ways. And I think that the GM at that point needs to go, hold on, everyone, stop and address it right then and there. You know, this, this is a game about X, Y, Z, and I'm going to ask that everyone is respectful for everyone else at the table. We've got four hours together here. I want everyone to enjoy this game. If you can't do that, then I'm going to ask you to leave. And that's it. It needs to be firm. It needs to be short. It doesn't need to be over-explained. And I'd let them address their behavior or leave. I don't think that there's an in-between. Absolutely. Oh, I, I absolutely agree that that uh, it's not, that's why I, I, I don't get into it with, with someone uh, at the table with, with something in that regard. I mean, if, if, if they consistently continue to interrupt with it, 
that I might say, okay, we're going to take a little break, and then can I, can I speak to, to someone you brought lately? Um, are we going to be able to do this? This way, you're, I'm not calling them out at the table. Uh, I'm not calling them out in front of everyone else. They don't need to put up a, a, a defensive shield in that regard. Uh, I just simply ask them, well, this is the way the game is played. These are the characters, these are the NPCs. Um, are we going to be able to do this, you and I? Are, are we going to be able to play this way? Are, are we going to continue to have a problem? Okay. And uh, I got that from my teaching days, where if you take someone aside, you're not forcing them to uh, be defensive or, and to save face in front of everyone else. You're not embarrassing them in front of everyone else. You just sort of take a moment, take a break, you know, okay, let's have a little, a little bathroom break or a little uh, movement break for a moment, and then just kind of casually take them aside. Like, how are we going to work this out? Yeah. Are we going to be able to do this? Yeah, de-escalation is important in that situation. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Um, going with that then, what what role does representation play in um, in gaming? Because I believe that you have to see something. If you see something, you can be that thing. And that's one of the reasons why in my engineering class, I had posters of women engineers and minority engineers because the engineering field is unfortunately predominantly male and white. And I wanted the other students in my class to see that that's not who engineers are, that anybody can be an engineer. Absolutely. Um, or what are some good examples of representation? That, uh, I would say, uh, let's take the Forgotten Realms, for example, uh, because that's the world I'm most familiar with. Uh, but it can apply to just anywhere, really. In the Forgotten Realms, you have the Sword Coast and you have the... the the Dale lands and whatnot, you have a great deal of diversity in population. And including that in what you're doing, if it's the NPCs, if you're sitting at a table with five white guys, five white cisgender guys, it doesn't mean that every NPC they're going to encounter is going to be like them in some way. Uh, I like including that. I, I, I think it's very important to include that inclusivity because, again, with that verisimilitude, there's very few places you can still really go that everything, everyone is exactly the same. Uh, so I think that it is important to include that sort of inclusivity in everything, where you have people from, uh, so the Turkish people are, are dark skinned, dark haired. Uh, the people of Chult. Uh, you have uh, the, the 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 East and, uh, and and all of what's going on there. You just call it Oriental Adventures, and it sort of changed oh, yeah. that a bit. Yeah, <laughs> um, it was it was a quickly correct term at the time, but it's changed over time. And I think that gaming and the gaming community has evolved with it by and large. Do you guys uh, do, do both of you think the gaming community is in a good place these days? Sorry, it's an off-the-cuff question, but you made me realize: Are we as a community in a good place overall when it comes to um, being an open and welcoming? Because I still see when I look at the when I look at the population and I look at the people who walk through the door in the gaming store and that post online, I still see a very homogenous um, group. Do you think that we've Do you think that we've made strides towards being more inclusive? I I think that. It really comes down to individual players and individual, uh, it's there. It, it's, it's the availability is there. And I think that uh, I see more, um, more gamers who are not homogenous now than, than before. I see a lot more girl gamers. Uh, I, I remember starting out and playing my, my very first D&D character and they didn't have, for me, a, a female character to play. I had to play a male character. And when I asked to play a female character the next time around, uh, the DM as a punishment made me uh, this incredibly gorgeous character that every NPC hit on. And it was, I, I fought through it. Uh, I, stood, I stood my ground and continued to play the character, continued to play. Uh, but I see now a lot more girls and women coming to the table and then i see i've started to see more uh more for lack of a better term people of various shades not just white anymore 
coming to games. I also learn. Uh, so I see a lot of diversity in the LARPing community, a lot of diversity. So, um, but I do think that it's, it's, it's tough because it's, it's a, um, we're competing with a lot of things. I think that role playing games are competing with a lot of things. I agree with that. Um, Alyssa, what do you think? I think I think we have come a long way. That's not for us to sit on our levels and stop. I think conversations like this and keeping the conversation going and out there is going to continually help us evolve. Um, uh, you know, I can go down to our local Guardian Games here in Portland. Um, it's a very large store. They have a lot of in-store gaming. And honestly, it, it was... It was like being on the streets of New York, and I mean that in a good way. It was so diverse. It was so wonderful. So many nationalities, so many genders, everyone laughing and joking, you know, with all of these different little sort of gaming groups. And it was heartening. It was truly heartening. And then when you, you look at the conventions now, whether they be large or small, and you look at how many um, uh, just – Almost every gender is represented there, um, but you've got the you know you've got young players, you've got old players, you've got female players, you've got male players, you've got uh, you've got almost every nationality represented. I think we have come a long way, with, without a doubt. And then to Gina's point, you know, where earlier on it's like uh, it almost where that you've got to play a woman character, you've got to be good looking, and of course they're going to hit on you. You know, we've we've got to a point now where GMs, you know, are sitting there going. Um, do you want to play male or female, or do you want to, you know? And it, I think there's a, the, the the social etiquette has almost sort of uh, evolved a, a little bit. Um, so I I do I think we're definitely moving in the right direction. Now with that, um, I think oh sorry, go on, Gina. I was just like I think that with that we have the opportunity to make that 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 bridge to it again, where we're playing in games where you have elves, dwarves, halflings. Dragonborn, um, Tiefling, whatever it may be, you have this diversity of, of, of races that uh, lend itself to them saying, well, you know, we have a diversity of players as well. And it's not really that different in that regard, is that we have, uh, it sort of almost teaches us, you know, it's a, it's a, terrible, a terrible warning because there's a lot of strife between certain races in various uh, gaming worlds. Uh, and also a shiny example of how things can be uh, integrated and, thing, and things can be simply, you go into a, a, a town and you're going to see mostly this population and then you're going to see what would be the minority populations in any given town. And you can look, you can look up the stats on most of the towns depending on the world you're in. Uh, with this 80% human and 10% dwarven and halfling and things like that. And those are statistics that apply to our, our own lives. And, and we're in a census here, so you can see that the data they're collecting now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause for a moment and bring in a picture um, and tell a secondhand uh, story. In the Player's Handbook for 5th Edition, this is the image um, in the book for human. And a friend of mine, um, a black female, said she wept when she saw it because yeah. she's never been the default image for human in her life. And I think that representation there is, uh, is a huge step. Um, Absolutely. Now, Alyssa, I have a question specifically for you because you play in a world where the games that you the games that you play and I've seen a lot of the a lot of the 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 DM thinking out loud posts that you've made in social media you have a um you would tackle the idea of of colonial uh the colonial behavior in diverse cultures how do you how do you walk that line without stereotyping either the without either stereotyping the players into into behavior that um is Great. Cats are awesome, by the way. I know. Oh that God. camera feed oh, right there. <laughs> um, without stereotyping players or NPCs in ways that are are unfortunate. It's the idea of, oh, if I'm going to play uh, like a native, I'm going to speak in this in this over dramatic tone and I'm going to I'm going to just be inappropriately, you know, simple. How do you how do you tackle those kind of 
role playing without stereotyping? No, that's a great question. So for Gina's benefit, I do a lot of Call of Cthulhu, um, and 1920s right now. Um, right. and I also do a lot of, um, Cthulhu Invictus and Cthulhu Invictus is based in the Roman times where while they were, I, I would argue a lot more racially aware and um, they obviously had slavery. Um, and so for my part, um, honestly, uh, like at the very beginning of some games, I always remember, even in a group that I've been with for the last 10 years, when we started playing in the 1920s Call of Cthulhu game, I actually sat down and said, okay, guys, so this is an era where there are certain racial minorities that are heavily frowned upon, but I'm not going to go heavy in that direction. There may be some undertones that come out. You may encounter some NPCs that will have a problem with certain other races. They are not reflective of me, the game, the other players at this table, and I'm not going to go heavily in that direction. Are we all comfortable with this? Um, and we got we got a general consensus and an agreement. But I, with that, with race, I, I don't I don't hammer on it like at all. I, I underplay it, if anything. Um, you know, it'll be the type of thing where I may have an NPC and I'll say, "Give me a roll." Yeah, you 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 don't think that he's particularly nice with you know. And they'll go, oh, okay, okay, he's a racist, okay, I get it. But I'm not role-playing racism at the table, so I'm not forcing anyone to uh, be uh, or react to that at all. And uh, additionally, I don't do accents, man. I mean, I, I so I'm not going to, like, I'm going to take my players into Egypt here shortly, and I'm not going to try and put on that accent and try and parody, like, some people, uh, uh, you know, living in Egypt. I play them. Like they're human beings, like just like anyone else. And I just play it. I play the character. I'm not playing them. I'm not trying to anticipate their race. I'm not trying to anticipate their culture, you know? So I, I, I think I, I avoid it by not trying to uh, uh, appropriate it, if that makes any sense. No, I think that's great. If you play humans like humans, it turns out you play them well. Right. Yeah. Gina, do you have anything to add to that? Um... Not really. That's, that's pretty much, I, I take the, t the same stance. Uh, I do do accents, but I don't necessarily do an accent that has anything to do with with where they're from in, in that same way. Uh, I don't assume that people from uh, one region or another would necessarily talk a certain way. Um, it might be more of a, a like, 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 I'm not talking about elves and dwarves, though. I'm not, not, not a variety of different humans. But, uh, I might assign something just for flavor, but it might have nothing to do with what one would assume it would be. It could be any number of things. I have some sort of a whole bunch of, of, of sort of vaguely sound different sort of uh, ways of speaking that indicate they're from this region or that region. It's not a, a racial thing, it's a regional thing. Just like in the United States, regardless of what color you are, um, <laughs> what your, your cultural background might be, uh, when you cross the Mason-Dixon line, you start to get more y'all. Yeah. And when you get, yeah, when you get past, uh, past the Philadelphia area, you start to get more yous and yins. And that's just how people talk. It has nothing to do with their, their ethnic background whatsoever. It's a regional thing. Right. And it might be, that might be why I, I, I they speak a bit differently. I, I may, it may not even be an accent. I, I do use, um, I, I use things to indicate that people are, are from different regions, and when they mix in, that, that 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 you can hear the different regional dialects that are coming along. I think everybody from the the far north has sort of that 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 rougher kind of, you know, I I, I drink beer through the winter, sort of. Uh, I I coffee through the winter. I'm from New England. I coffee through the winter, sort of people. That's just how it is. I know, and it's it's more that than it is anything specific. I also I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to I wouldn't try to appropriate uh, a, a an applied uh, an applied ethnicity to any any fantasy race. Or keeping in mind also in, in, in any game that we're playing, obviously this is not the 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 earth that we're on. 
right. even in, in a Cthulhu game, this is an alternate reality. So those rules may not apply anymore. Something changed. More than one thing changed, but there is the butterfly effect. Um, and if this thing is different, then all these other things are different too. I'll be honest with you. So here I am. Okay, so I'm an English white girl, right? And um, mm. I actually had someone sit at a table once, and I was a player doing an English accent, and they weren't <laughs> English. Um, and it became a parody of an English accent, of course. Oh. And within within half an hour, an hour, it's like I, I just I was done. You know, I was just done. Now I'm not in any way, shape, or form a minority. But my game was like turning miserable fast because this guy was actually doing an English accent. That's it. And no one on the planet would think that that was necessarily a bad thing. But then I read an article somewhat recently where they were talking about, no, if you're going to sit there at the table and do an Indian accent or a Scottish accent or, or whatever, that, that, can, that can be just as bad, especially if you're amongst a group of players where that they're actually not appreciating it. Um, so yeah, I, I that's what one reason why I tend to just stay away from them. You, as a GM, you pretty like I'll do what Gina's doing, and I'll do these little mannerisms, even verbal mannerisms. But um, I'm all my all my PCs sound basically English. They sound like me, you know, uh, you know, with minor variation. But yeah, yeah, not everybody's Matt Mercer, that's for sure. <laughs> um, now. We've talked about just like uh, racial representation. What are some ways that we can safely represent um, not just neurodiversity, but also um, neuro behaviors? For example, depression or anxiety or um, or autism or even a stutter. Uh, I've actually had players who have been very uncomfortable when, as a DM, I have a character that has a stutter, and what's a way that we can we can pre- represent those things again without parodying them because those are different Gina, than accents you answer that gina you're the teacher you, i'm sure you've got a great opinion on this uh yeah i have about two opinions someone might have a problem with someone having a stutter um or something like that but at the same time if i have a highly successful m- 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 merchant that can get through a c- c- conversation and be very successful then it does give an example of how that doesn't mean you're not successful and capable. And if someone does have a problem with that, um, I don't do it. It's not that important to me. Right. It's not something I have to have. It gets you closer to your player. Uh, if someone is having a problem with it, even if they're not saying it, you can tell by their body language, you can tell by their behaviors, what they're not comfortable with, uh, you can tell what's not working. And then you leave it. You let it go. It's not something that's important. And, and, and that's that's something I can easily, you know, get around. I like also having NPCs and even PCs that have various different. Um, I don't want to call them disabilities. They have different challenges. They are they are diverse in a number of different ways. One of the uh, most important. Characters in one of my favorite novel series, Dragonlance, had one arm. And that was his badge of, of, of honor. Is right. that, that arm was sacrificed. So it was very um, important to me. Characters that maybe can't do something as well or do, to do things differently. Uh, characters that are mute and communicate in a different sort of way, which becomes, at first for the players, a bit of a puzzle. And then they they learn something new and something different about how to communicate. And they'll learn some, some bits of either sign or however it may be that they communicate. Some some characters, I had one character, uh, one, one NPC, who, who had lost the entire lower half of her face. It was eaten by zombies. And she had a, a so similarly, it was a, a, a metal soul-looking part that was where her jaw was. She couldn't speak. Obviously, she also couldn't eat, uh, and it was interesting to have her as the guide go through uh, an area. She's a ranger, and she would she taught them the various signs and signals that she used uh, 
And so then that added to the tapestry of, of, of playing, having a, a, a bar or an inkeep or someone who uh, wheels around behind the bar. It's another thing that, that, that makes things inclusive. It, it, these people exist in the tapestry of the setting, and these people are successful and are included in the society. And I, I guess is they're there, but I don't make a huge deal out of out of it. I, I might just say that you know he he rolls his wheelchair up the ramp and then you know pours the drinks and and puts the tray on the glass and walks out and and, and, and walks out, sorry and rolls out and 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 I don't really make a thing out of it. I just that's how I describe how he does it. Um, I think that that's all very important stuff to to consider. I agree. I've um, I actually had a uh, person once tell me that I was playing a person with ADD wrong, which is really difficult for them to tell me, seeing that I have ADD and I, I knew exactly <laughs> how to play it. Um, but I think that it's the there's a derogatory term that I hear, especially when people try to represent like depression or a dark character is they, you know, don't turn into an edge lord, And um, it's it's important to have things like this, uh, to have neurodiversity present. But um, Jen King in the in the Twitch chat mentioned this, that we can't lose the diversity out of fear of misrepresenting it. And one of the things that I was talking about uh, that I responded is that's why it's important we have two way communication between the players and the DM. And there are times when it's okay to stop the game and step out and say, you know, like, for example, if I don't know how to represent something, I'll say, I don't know how to represent this character's behavior, but you would, the description is this, and please fill it in appropriately. Or if I'm representing a character that has, because um, I run a, I ran another game at GaryCon called Gardens of Fog, and it deals with depression and anxiety. And mm -hmm. um, it's a great way of teaching people how to, how to have those communications and interactions with themselves and with others. And um, I, I didn't know I had depression until I was in my 30s and I was diagnosed. And I'm like, oh, that's what that was all that time. I just thought I was really just, you know, standoffish. And I don't think that even even knowing that what I've experienced is depression, I don't think that I could effectively communicate it as a DM to other players in a way that would register with them as depression rather than uh, just being moody or, or brooding. Hmm. Yeah. yeah it is, it's, 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 I would say there's an expression uh, regarding um, autism. If you know someone with autism, you know someone with autism. Because it's not always the same. Right. And how, how any of that is represented uh, can be very different. There are a lot of different ways. And depending on how, how deeply you want it. And, and for me, it, it's, it's important. I like going diving deep. Getting into various various things that come out if I if I need to convey that a character is suffering from depression or is depressed uh, there are, are, are some there are ways that, that I'll, I'll I'll include that it's, it's, it's I'll pick on things that I'll flow into things that like the the apathy or the insecurity that comes with it and the the, Sometimes the overcompensation. I mean, they're, they're not getting it. I'll just straight out say they seem like no matter what, they're just not happy. Yeah. And and and, and state it directly then. If that's if if I don't feel that I can I can represent something appropriately. Uh, but in a lot of ways, when it comes to depression, anxiety, uh, there are inappropriate ways. There are no. There really aren't inappropriate ways. There are the most obvious, the ones that are the, the ones that we all think they are, and then there's what really is. And it is you, without making it into a caricature. Of, and I think that's the important like, thing, like, right, Gina? Just don't make yeah, it yeah. into a caricature. Yeah. Yeah, don't uh, make I think it's a right. Yeah. I think it's okay as a GM. Um, like I'm not, I actually don't know. Um, any autistic people directly. I, I've got very dear friends I know have autistic children, um, but I don't know them in the real life sense. If I'm going to play an autistic character, I actually would be extremely self-confident about that I'm about to turn this into a caricature, and I'm going to potentially upset people, so I'm not going to. I'm probably more likely as a GM going to say, 
yeah, you actually think um, that he may actually be on the autistic side of things, and then allow the players to do to take that. You know, and mm-hmm. I don't have to do the caricature of this. I don't have to pantomime this thing out because I'm going to offend someone. I'm going to get it wrong. So know my own limitations in that respect. Be cognizant and aware and em- empathic to the table and just say it, you know, a little bit uh, like uh, a lot of time when you said earlier on, um, you know, just it, it, it you just you can actually just say it to the players. I don't know how to do this. I'm not even going to try and do this. You know, this person is on the autistic spectrum. And that's it. And you don't need to mm-hmm. go any further with it. Right. And it's, it's, you have to feel like you're, you're able to represent that before you try to. And it's, it's, it's something that I know that I have experience with because I have a child with autism. Uh, and so I see some aspects and some, some of that neurodiversity uh, with her. I have a niece with, with severe autism who doesn't speak, who communicates with a, a picture board. She's, eight years old, she, she points to pictures. And uh, so I, I know I have that experience. We, uh, as DMs of storytellers, and just like authors, in a way, uh, who you have to write from what you know, or what you learn about, or what you research, you have to DM um, within what you know and understand. And when you don't understand it or don't know it, uh, you either put the legwork in, or you very simply say, I don't know how to role play this, but this is what you see. This is, this is what you hear. Uh, if somebody says, you heard someone say that, or it appears as if they're very depressed, or that the, their mood swings are very wide. You, know, you have somebody who, who has bipolar, and, it, you, and, and, and for a character, that's a, that's a it's a very big difference between bipolar and chaotic neutral. Yes. And I can't stress that enough. Yes. Because I've had players who played um, chaotic neutral characters as, as though they are bipolar. And oh. that's not um, appropriate. And I usually sort of give them some tips on you know, the difference. Of it. That's, that doesn't mean you have to swing and cycle like that. No. That's something else. Yeah. Um, no, and I think that it's important. And in fact, honestly, the, one of the best things I've seen in modern gaming is us getting away from alignment as a, like a hard and fast, um, a hard and fast rule because alignment itself allowed for so many stereotypes. We know the paladin stereotype. Um, and in fact, in an earlier chat, I was talking about having two good characters that both think they're doing good yet can be morally opposed to each other because their idea of good is completely different. Um, and one of the other, one of the other areas that I've been struggling with when it comes to diversity, and this is a weird one that I don't think most people think about, but political diversity in gaming, uh, not just the political diversity of the, the characters in the story, but also the political diversity of your players, because some of your players will have very different, um, moral foundations and they may clash in ways with each other that their that their values personally um will 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 disrupt the gaming how how can we how can we work with players to make things like that and this is by the way is where i think this table the safety system comes into play for people who don't normally realize it's something that's useful because there's a lot of hot button topics out there right now absolutely absolutely um one of my first rules is that we don't bring real world politics to the table. I, I didn't come here to talk about a wall, unless of course it's surrounding a city. I can't. Yeah, we're storming. Yeah. So um, yeah, I, I don't. I don't acknowledge my comments that our people push it, throw into uh, uh, while we're playing. Um, if it gets to be too much, I might mention it. I may say something. Um, as one of the mods in Forgotten Realms ar- archives, uh, I'm accustomed to enforcing that rule, and that we um, we don't allow real world politics and real world news into uh, we, we don't insert it into what we're talking about in regards to to the topics that we do talk about. Because it's not. Forgotten Realms related, 
we don't want to know. We don't want to hear about it. Uh, we want to talk about the return of Joaquin and how that affects the economy and that's ATLA. That's great. But we're not going to talk about um, what's going on in a, you know, the Brexit. It's not going to happen. It's not part of the conversation. So, uh, and I'm not comparing. I don't, I won't allow it because it's, it's, it, takes, it takes away from what we're doing and it, it takes us out of that suspension of disbelief. I, yep. I couldn't I, agree with you more. I mean, I've got a group what, for the last 14 years or so. We have a rule, no politics at the table. And I know, actually, we all have the same political leaning. I, I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> sure. But no politics at the table. That's not what we're here for. We're here for the story. We're here to suspend uh, like uh, real life for a moment. We're here to put ourselves into the mind of someone else. And that's what we're going to do. And politics is a distraction from that. So no, will, no real life politics. I will counter, though, that um, I advertised the game that I was offering to DM for people as a game that had real world politics in it, but the, cause I did, I didn't, I wanted to address issues in a gaming world to see if it could be done. And one of the, that they did. what's that? That's something you specifically did. Yes, I specifically did, but I also let the players know in advance that th that's what we would be doing. And I think that right. being honest before you play is a great way of of allowing for certain issues. Um, for example, um, being honest on both sides. Talk about the issues that you're going to have, but also talk about the talk about the things that aren't going to be in your game. Um, I mean, classically we say no murder hope, no murder hoboing, but that's that's a, a joke in gaming. But for example, one of the things that um, a rule that hard and fast in all of my games is no, I almost, I want to say womanizing, but no sexualizing the uh, NPCs, no, no demeaning them. No, it's all of those things, no matter what your character's uh, gender or preference is. I don't want you essentially creeping on people in my game. Cause that's not something as a DM I'm comfortable DMing, but there are other games I've seen out there where that's actually you know, that's a thing that they talk about as being part of the game. And it's it's kind of up to setting those boundaries and standards before you play. And that kind of leads me to my final question, um, unless somebody from the peanut gallery on, on Twitch wants to throw something in there. My final question is, um, what, how can we set better standards in session zero and throughout the play experience to make sure our players really understand um, or, or really feel safe at all times? Well, I think that session zero is a getting to know you thing. It has to start out of the game and out of character before it gets into character. You're going to sit there and role play with each other. Uh, you're going to play characters. And I find, um, and I know this is a related topic uh, today, uh, that I, you know, so I said I've, I've, I've tabletop games, I've electronic games, and I've LARPed, which for those who may not know, that's live action role playing. You dress in costume, mm -hmm. you have buffer weapons, and you play your character from Friday night to a Sunday afternoon. You stay in character. You sleep in character. You pee in character. So it's you're in your character at all times. Uh, and now we're talking, if you want to talk about political conversations or racial tension, other things like that, you have a bunch of people in real life, face to face, actually with the, the, talking to each other in person with buffer weapons in their hands. So um, it, it, it's sort of, it, it, it's imperative that, that, that session zero has to be, these are the boundaries, these are the rules. Are we all on the same page? Are we all agreeing on this? Because this is how we're going to play the game. If we have to, depending on, on, on the, the dynamics of your players, either it's, it's you played a lot together or you have a lot of people, I have a lot of people of what the kids are, are going to talk about at the table uh, with the younger groups. But with adults, it's, it's sort of everyone's coming to the table and they have their whole, their whole real life that they're bringing with them. And it's important that we establish that ahead of time. I think before we can get to hunting goblins or trying to get the court from the dragon or trying to determine what the terrible unspeakable thing is that is behind the door, we need to have that conversation. We need to establish that, those ground rules. 
Absolutely. Um, in the Twitch chat, I put a link to a podcast talking about LARPing uh, in greater detail. It's from a podcast called Imaginary Worlds, and the episode yep. call, was called Winning the LARP. It was a very good uh, <laughs> look at LARPing. Yeah. And he actually brings up a lot of the diversity and inclusion things that we're talking about. And he did, a, he right. did another episode later that you can search for yourselves that he starts participating and talks about how it affected him. Um, now, when you say that, when you were talking about LARPing, to get off topic from what we were saying about Session Zero, well, actually, I'll come back to LARPing. Uh, Alyssa, do you have anything uh, that you want to add for like setting expectations, maintaining them in Session Zeros throughout and throughout the game? Yeah, just a couple of things. And one of them is actually covered in the toolkit that you linked to earlier. Um, but first and foremost, I'm running Call of Cthulhu games, uh, Cthulhu Invictus games. I'm never, I'm never going to run something I know is a hot button topic. I'm just not going to do it, okay? Um, but if I do feel like there is a subject matter that may be touched upon within this horror game, then I'm going to bring it up at the beginning. Like Gina said, I'm gonna, like ground rules. Just so you guys know, this is Call of Cthulhu. This is going to feature x y and z if you're uncomfortable with that let me know now um so i always i don't want to say set a tone that sounds too ominous but if i feel like something is going to be introduced that someone may be offended by it, i'll let them know up front um although i don't do that type of stuff too much on the nose if you know what i mean um, but the other one from the actual toolkit is here's a card everyone take one it's got your cx card and if anything mm -hmm. anything happens during this game just Show me the card. I'm not going to ask what, uh, why. I'm not going to challenge you. Just show me, and we will change the mood immediately. And and so I just give everyone that, uh, that panic button, so to speak, if they need it. Um, and I think that just – I don't run games where they need that, but I want them to know that it's there for folks. Um, and thus far, no one's needed it, but they I, I make sure everyone has it, you know. Just let me know. Just – put your hand on this and we will change the tone immediately so i do that at the beginning of the game yeah um so gina you have a more experience in larping i actually larped in the bad old days before boffers and in the um, <laughs> in the mid 90s we were playing uh vampire the masquerade and one of my that. yeah one of my first um one of my first experiences with really breaking stereotypes is there's a there's a there's a clan which all clans are essentially giant stereotypes, but there's a clan oh, that's yeah. Mal Malkavian, and they're known for madness, and people would generally play them as over the top like court jesters or off the wall characters. And what I ended up playing is a character that was mad, but his madness expressed itself in believing he was something he wasn't. So yes, he was a Malkavian. He had all of those characteristics and, and aspects, but he really believed he was a Toreador, an artist. And mm -hmm. to the point where when the character finally died in the game and I showed my character sheet to other people, they were floored by the fact that I wasn't actually a Toreador. His madness was simple. It was just a delusion. And it was oh. a really convincing delusion to everybody around him. And to me, that's that's just as stereotype breaking as having a, a, a barbarian with intelligence or a sober dwarf or a character with parents. I mean, those are all stereotype breaking. What are some what are some of the um, what are some of the things that LARPing itself has a stereotype to it, but what are some of the things that that you feel you could get out of it or could help you with understanding diversity if you were to uh, to entice another player to check it out? LARPing? Yes. Uh, uh, the way I would explain LARPing to people who've never LARPed before is I, I say he's a very, very bare bones. When we are playing a tabletop game, the DM says to you, uh, you and your group are walking down the trail and a group of goblins step out of the tree line. In LARPing, you and your friends are walking down a trail and a bunch of your other friends step out of the tree line wearing goblin masks. There's no rolling initiative. You just do your thing. And uh, it takes about six seconds, it's actually about right, uh, to, to get from point A to point B in that. Um, so it, it, it goes quick like that. But um, it is a totally different experience to actually step into your character. I've watched young people, high school age 
people who have gone from quiet, mousy, sort of very shy to becoming the town villain or the king or the queen over the course of a few years. And one of the things I think that tabletop and LARPing both actually have in common, you get to experience things you might not experience in your day-to-day -day life, depending on just, just what, what's around you. You get to take risks that you wouldn't take in real life, but that you can go ahead and give that a try and go with your bad self, if you will. I mean, you can't get away with these things in the workplace or in a school, but you get away with those things. I spent a lot of time hiding out in the woods and knocking people unconscious and taking their stuff. <laughs> I did. I, I, I was mistress of the thieves' guilt at one point, and I became mistress of thieves' guilt by killing the prior master of the thieves' guilt. And I did so in a fit of pique because he disregarded me because I was a woman, and he kept on teaching the male members of the, of, of the guild, but he wouldn't teach me. He just left me home to be the, the dead mother. Uh, but what he didn't realize is that everything that had passed to the Thieves Guild, I single-handedly killed. Wow. I didn't talk about it. I just didn't. He left me there. You know? <laughs> and if anything attacked, I'd die or kill it. That was the way it went. And that was, it was empowering to me as a personal story, empowering to me that I didn't need these guys to protect me. And that when I, when I popped JR in the back of the neck, back between his shoulder blades, because there's safety rules with Lord, but uh, between his shoulder blades and knocked him out and then killed him, he, he could not have been more surprised. And it was a lesson taught, learned by everyone around us that, that it, it was, it was, uh, it's something that, that, that has to be experienced to really be understood. To, um, as Alias uh, put it from um, uh, the Finder Stone series, um, you haven't lived until you've killed and eaten something that tried to kill and eat you. And it's a little different when at 3 o'clock in the morning, you're woken up by a noise in the woods, and you don't know whether that was you know, just some animal or an NBC. <laughs> and that, that's, a, that's an experience to be had. So I know that when people are LARPing, um, there's often a, a story set in advance um, and the characters will inhabit uh, different roles or different personas. Um, have mm -hmm. you ever, have you ever inhabited a, like a persona outside of your, uh, outside of your realm of experience that's taught you something? Yeah. Uh, it doesn't make a difference how many good things you do for the town. Uh, once a thief, always a thief. And you're not going to have that respect if that's what you, you, you do. And when you are, when you get your hands dirty and do things that are, are against the law and whatnot, uh, it doesn't make a difference all the good things you do afterward. Uh, and it is a, a lesson in reputation. It's a lesson in uh, uh, consequences, natural consequences. Uh, and that just because somebody is much different than yourself, doesn't mean that they're not your best ally. Because okay. it could be very well, very well could be. All right. Um, so I've asked the, I've asked uh, Twitch if they have any questions and it seems pretty quiet. I'm going to kind of stall for another moment and see if anybody in Twitch, maybe who's listening and wasn't paying attention to the chat, has any questions for us. Um, while they, while they type that, do you, uh, either of our panelists have any final thoughts in case we, uh, in case we wrap it up a little early? Nope, not for my part. No, I think we covered a lot of ground today. All right. I would say that, that I think that um, we as, as, as DMs and players need to be aware um, that it's our responsibility to make other people feel welcome at the table and make them feel welcome in, in in what we do. We, we are passionate about what we do. We, we, we love doing this. And when we get to share that with somebody, uh, it feels great. And, and I hate to think anyone feels left out or feels that they can't do something. I know one of the things we didn't really touch on 
uh, is some of those other things that maybe maybe some people are reluctant to come to the table with. And that, that's things like like hearing deficits, visual deficits, and things like that that we can also uh, address. And and I think that that it's important that we we are inclusive because there is definitely room for, for more improvement on that. Always, always. And uh, I think that we need to continue to be cognizant of it and continue to uh, share, brainstorm ideas that make things more welcoming to more people. All right. Um, so one thing that uh, I wanted to add is that if we want um, if, if we practice diversity and inclusion, then we're inviting more people to come play. And we all could definitely use more friends who play, who play tabletop and LARPs and all of those things with us. So if, if we are just growing our community when we're inclusive, uh, we have a Absolutely. question. We have a question from uh, Metamer who says, are there any recommendations for being a player and doing my part to welcome diverse groups to the table, particularly at convention games, which are a challenge for me? I would say the biggest thing that my first suggestion is if you see somebody hovering, even as a player, um, you can say, hi, you know, if the, if, if the table's full, you can still say hi to them. Or, you know, would you like to see what we're doing and have them shadow over your shoulder or let them watch or just say hi, because sometimes a friendly smile and a friendly face, and it says little Sesame street, but a friendly smile and a, and a, and a, and a nice hello is, a huge, like it just melts people's hearts and really makes them feel welcome in a place where they may not feel welcome, especially if there's something about them that makes them feel that they're different or stand out. Um, do either of you have something to add that could make, a, as a player, you could do to make other people feel welcome? Yeah. Um, as a, so as a GM, and I'm, I'm going to answer it from a player's perspective, as a GM, you're responsible for looking at the entire table and ensuring that everyone is getting equal play time. Um, you don't want one player dominating everything and one player sitting there quietly for the entire duration because they don't get to do anything. Um, as a GM, you kind of learn to pace things nicely and everyone gets to have a go at things. I think as a player, you can do the same thing. Um, don't dominate the table. Be empathic to the entire table. But look at your fellow players. Ensure that they are having fun. Um, like you said, reach out to them. Let Open the door for them. This is a social thing. Don't let one person keep on talking all the time. If you see one person's not getting an opportunity, it's okay for you to say, what do you think? Or did you? is there something that you would like to do? And Absolutely. so players can help facilitate that as well. You don't have to leave it to just a GM. You don't have to have one player dominate the whole thing. Um, it's okay to, you know, if humans like talking about themselves, they we, we just do. And so you're going to get the, the, the plenty of these social times at the table where one player is now taking this as an opportunity to tell everyone his knowledge of the Roman Empire because you happen to be playing Cthulhu Invictus. And if the GM isn't doing anything about that and it's just becoming very dominating, it's okay as a player if you go, is this something that you want to do in this situation? And steer the conversation away. You know, Let this person have their opportunity. Open the door for them in a way. Gina? Uh my my advice as a player is to be patient with your fellow players. Uh, be patient with, uh, and especially in your your diverse environment. Be patient. There are, are some people who have slower processing speed. They need a couple extra minutes or a couple extra seconds. They need to, to have. They need to have repeated. They need. They don't understand or they're very concrete thinking, or they just can't visualize it the way you can sometimes. Be patient. Maybe they get flustered. Maybe they're, they're very anxious to begin with. Uh, and, and, and for them, like my son, I get very flustered. He gets he has social anxiety, and he'll get flustered about, uh, about something, and then he'll shut down. And to be patient and allow someone to Think it through, or give them a hand. You know, hey, did you know that you have this skill here? And you could use it this way, or you could use it that way, and make them feel like you're a team, and you're on this together because you are. You know, nothing, nothing's more toxic than when you've got one player who's trying to kill off everybody else. <laughs> so, 
to be patient with each other and to be open-minded and respectful is, is, is very important. Those are my three top rules. Top rules. Patience and open-mindedness and respect. Yeah, and as uh, a player and yeah. as a DM, uh, one of the things that I've done is I have a, a bunch of secret ways of of helping people who I see are struggling. Uh, for example, new players always get hung up on the dice and I tell them that I'm superstitious and I like to keep my dice with the highest number up. I don't tell them that that's a good way to, to remember which die is what number, a D20, an eight or what whatnot. Mm -hmm. But by telling them that I like to have the highest number up so they learn to roll that way, players will then realize that, that it's easy to identify which is the six, which is the, well, the six is never hard, the four, the, the, the you know, the, the 12 and the 10 and those things without me specifically saying, hey, you don't know the dice do this. Another thing is, um, and this is a teacher thing in me as well, being an educator, uh, like Alyssa said, reading the table is very important. If I see a player that's, that needs the time like Gina was talking about, I'll say, hey, um, your turn is up after this or you know, you're on deck or something like that. So they have a few extra moments to prepare. So it's not like I suddenly just turn to them and like, all right, you, what are you gonna do? And that's a lot. It's, it's suddenly like, a, it's a shock. And yeah. by, by giving gentle clues and gentle reminders and just reading what your players need, I feel like it's a little bit more, um, it's, it's, a, it's a way to address the players without necessarily addressing what might be the underlying reason. Right, right. As, as a, a parent of an autistic child, um, I've had the experience of having my child have a meltdown at the table at a con. And uh, I've had more than once. And some experiences I've had have been that everyone's sort of frustrated with that and they're not interested in playing anymore and they get very, it sort of a break thing. And then I've had other experiences where people have said, all right, well, you know what? This is a good time for a break. Let's take a minute. Let's let everybody kind of have their space for a moment. And then we can get back to what we're doing. And it, it's, a, it's, it's a godsend to me. When, when there are people at the table who can do that, who can say, oh, well, something's going on. Um, let's give it a minute. You know, let's, we, all have our, we all have our days, we all have our moments. And, um, and that's, that's, a, that's a tough one when, when, when a, a person, a meltdown at the table. I'm not talking like, an, like a temper tantrum flip the table kind of thing. I mean, like a, 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 I can't handle the simulation kind of yeah. thing. Or a tabletop game that is, is not one with, with a, a board out and then figures on the on the board for someone who needs to visually see it to be patient and maybe you know help them like visualize and draw it out for them so they can see what's going on so that's that that's the, the things that that have made a difference and have made the table more uh welcoming for my players not just my kids but other players as well yeah I, I think that's yeah. important. Are there any resources uh, that either of you can think of that we can share with the with the audience that they should check out or they can um, they can look at? The toolkit that you posted earlier is an awesome resource. And actually, I'll to, I'll um, I'm going to post two good links about safety toolkits right now again, just in case people have joined us since then. Um, is there anything else? Um. Well, I remember you brought up before about uh, you playing ADHD wrong, and uh, there is a, a website. Not I'm trying to find the name of it. I'm sorry. Uh, give me a moment. It's quite all right. My ADHD thing. Um, that really any website, any any website or resource that can uh, honestly inform you a little more. Yeah. about some of the things. And, and if we really are being honest, uh, there's a lot of those stereotypical gamer behaviors that uh, we could relook at and see them for what they probably are uh, on, a, on a, a neurodiverse sort of scale. Yeah, I also uh, like to remind people that there are, the neurodiversity is all around you. People may not wear oh, yeah. it on their, on their chest, but... Um, it's an invisible thing that surrounds all of us. Yes, and mental health issues as well. To to just be informed, and that, that that carries over into your everyday life. And and when 
when we consider those things, not just in our day-to-day -day life, but also in if when we're, we're we're participating in recreation and participating. And we wouldn't think twice about making a modification for uh, a team if someone had uh, some sort of, of, of reason why we needed to, to make that modification for a sports team. I'm not talking on a professional level. I mean on, on a social level. If we're all playing basketball on the court and someone is a little slower than the rest of us, at, at passing the ball and whatnot. I know there's a time limit on that. But when you know that that person's not doing it because they're trying to break the rule, but because they need that extra moment, we don't typically say, oh, we're not, your time's up, it's it. Let's go on, come on, move it. We learn to work with it as a team. And it should be the same thing with those things we don't see when we're playing a game, when we're playing a game at a table, when we're playing uh, even online. It's, it's it's something that we should consider, that we would we, we make those modifications in other ways, in other places in our, our lives. And it's something we should make for our players at our tables. Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing that anyone can walk away with from this is be empathetic. Have empathy for Absolutely. the people around you. Yeah. And to address those people who say, where are we doing that? Well, great. Uh, uh, the minute I think that I'm doing everything I possibly can, is a minute I've failed yeah. as a DM because there's always something I don't know everything. None of us, does. nobody does. Even the experts. An expert is actually somebody who knows where to find the information, not someone who knows all the information off the top of their head. So the minute I stop learning about ways in which I can make it a more inclusive environment, uh, it's the minute that I, I stop being good at it. I, I stop having a passion for it. Yeah, I learned the most in my life when I stopped thinking I when I stopped thinking I was good at something and admitted I needed to learn more about it is when I think I really learned the most about how to see things from other people's perspective. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap up. Um thank thank my panelists, Alyssa and Gina. You guys were great. Um thank it you. was wonderful having you. I'm thank glad you. we were able to make this panel happen even with the uh the COVID-19 and to the audience who've been popping in and out, thank you so much. I will be posting a recording of this uh, to YouTube and then posting it in the GaryCon site for anyone to check out and share later. Um, you can also uh, DM me directly either on Twitter um, and I will put my, my Twitter handle in there. Also, the, um, if either of you panelists wanna self-promote yourselves, where can people find you on Twitter, the social medias or anywhere else? Well, um... Um, Twitch.tv forward slash Alyssa Faden um, is one of the best ways to get me. Uh, but I'm also Alyssa Faden on Instagram and um, Alyssa Faden on Facebook. I'm on Facebook, Gina Sudol. Um, and uh, yeah, I have the GN Sudol. That's, that's me too. But it's it's more my, my writing site. But uh, definitely uh, let me know that you, you if you have questions or if you have anything that you want to talk about any other other things, ideas you've had too, any of you. Yeah, and I actually recommend, uh, I believe Alyssa, you're doing some art after this, so you may want to check out her stream after this. It'll be, uh, I'm sure it'll be fun. Um, well, thank you everybody, enjoy your GaryCon, and thank you for helping us make this happen because in these times of crisis, it's fun to get together and converse and do normal gamer things. So have a good one. Absolutely. You too. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Thank you. Oop. And and we're out.